let us start this post lunch session which is a technical session as per the schedule we have four speakers delivering their lectures in this session uh, but unfortunately the first speaker dr vinayshil gautam expressed his regret not means he is unable to attend the conference due to some unexpected engagements that have come up so we'll begin this afternoon session with professor p v rao before inviting him and the other speakers onto the dais a brief about p v professor p v rao or is first i'll invite everyone uh, i'll in, i invite all the speakers onto the dais professor p v rao <laughs> professor krishnendra meena The third speaker, who, um, Dr. Sanjeev Ranjan, would be joining us online, and uh, I request Sudhir uh, Devre sir, Sudhir Devre sir, to chair the session. <laughs> <laughs> the first lecture is by Professor P. V. Rao. Before inviting him, a brief about him. Professor P. V. Rao, former director, Indian Ocean Centre, Usmani University, and National Fellow, ICSSR. He obtained MA in Political Science from Osman University with a first division, MPhil and PhD in European Studies from School of International Studies, JNU. He was recipient of number of scholarships and fellowships. He was awarded the British Council Scholarship at London School of Economics for Research. He also awarded Fulbright Postdoctoral Fellowship at the School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins University, Washington. He is also recipient of Ford Foundation Fellowship, etc. Professor Rao's areas of research include regional trade systems, SARC, maritime studies, South and Southeast Asian political and economic relations. Professor Rao published six books, which includes Indian Ocean and Noted Bibliography, Regional Cooperation in Indian Ocean, India and Indian Ocean, India and Australia New Horizons, India and ASEAN par Partners at Summit, and finally the sixth one, Directory of UGC Area Study Centers. Professor Rao is the founder editor of Indian Ocean Survey, a biannual international journal now being published by Routledge. He published over 40 research articles in Indian and foreign journals. Professor Rao was the director of Center for Indian Ocean Studies, Usmani University, member UGC Committee on Area Studies, member Indian Ocean Research Group. He regularly gives lectures at College of Warfare, College of Naval Warfare, and several other academic institutions. Now he will be delivering his lecture on the theme Bay of Bengal Maritime Connections, Current Trends. Now I request Professor P. V. Rao onto the dais. Professor Faruqi, the director of the Kest Studies Center, Manu University, other senior members of the Sino City. Ambassador Sudhir Devra, a good friend of mine and also chairman of Society for Indian Ocean Studies, with which for the last, I think, 25 to 30 years, I am also very closely associated. Admiral Arun Prakash, former chief of Indian Navy, with whom I used to quite often frequently interact. Now, I think born by default, by default of the previous scheduled speakers not being over here, uh, I am asked to speak, and perhaps I'll be able to get a bonus, a, a bonus of additional time also. Sometime back, a Delhi friend of mine asked me, very good friends, right from my JNU days. Kya kar rahe ho ab tum? To maine bola, I am writing a book on India, Navy, India's naval diplomacy. To Hyderabad me bhai ke bader kya kar rahe? Ocean ke baar me kya mulaqat hai? That precisely is the reason why I am writing. You can't rule away landlocked states or hinterland states from the ocean. Then I told him, sir, please correct me. There was a vice admiral Sridharan. He wrote a book, See Our Saviour. In that, he wrote very briefly introduction. All those people to the north of India mountains, they have not seen ocean in their lifetime. And all those to the south of the Vindyas, which generally called Dakkan, 
दे हैव नॉट गॉन टू द होली प्लेसेस लाइक काशी विश्वनाथ बद्रीनाथ एट्सेट्रा ऑफ द हिमालय दैट पर हैप्स वॉज मे बी आर पुट इट इन वेरी यूफेमिस्टिकल टर्म्स बट वॉट आई मीन टू से कैन हाउ कुड वाई कॉन्टेक्सुअलाइज फैक्टर दक्कन रीजियन with the ocean around us let us say the indian ocean rather being a hyderabadi do telugu is my mother tongue but i am born here now and then i am used to say it a typical local hyderabadi language yes, some of those i request to be bear with my broken hyderabad urdu and sometimes i mix hindi also into what can we speak in hyderabad neither pure urdu nor pure hindi call hindustani there used to be a port called bandar port to maina pucha mere dost ki bandar kya hai bandar abbas kya hai then i referred to my dakkan history books bandar abbas everybody knows the largest port of the persian gulf that means iran but bandar was not is the name of masuli patnam now called machli patnam on the bay of bengal coast now that belongs to andhra pradesh state there used to be a port that is still active had been there the dutch came maybe portuguese wanted to occupy But the Bandar port was under whose administration, under whose imperial control before the Europeans came. The Nizam of Hyderabad belonged to Asabzahi dynasty. They had kept Bandar under their control. But why? The reason is Dakkan in general, Hyderabad, the Hyderabad state of Asabzahi dynasty, had no access to the ocean. The Nizam of either mahbub ali pasha or is a predecessors they fought to keep bandar that is present machli patnam under their control that was the only way but there is another thing i will tell you very interesting story hyderabad used to be some of my students sorry my friends here young friends and also senior scholars know the india's old capital of the diamonds in hyderabad then even now in the old city we have got a place called karwan karwan was the hub of diamonds diamonds of golconda not just golconda kila and the fort all around the areas portuguese persians arabs some of those africans they would come down in their own way to the west coast of indian ocean the arabian sea etc all the way to hyderabad to buy at karwan but karwan was also known for another very important issue i may share with you those who already know i am sorry please bear with me in gujarat about 150 kilometers from ahmedabad there is a place called patan Patan during the earlier times was known for one of the best textile sarees as well as the dhotis and other cotton products. Generally, the Patanese people used to send them via Kanyakumari, Malacca State, Bay of Bengal to Southeast Asian countries. I had been there out of interest as a student of maritime affairs. By a Patan ka kuch ko mulaqat hai hamara Hyderabad se, mai to aaya hu Hyderabad se. then they told me the story some of the sarees which were viewed in patan they used to be sent to golconda empire or hyderabad to be precise kis liye the something called that adding some kind of a finish a final touch we call in telugu zari at the borders of the sarees some also call it ikatha in golconda hyderabad final touches will be given to the patan sarees and from here how do they go to southeast asian countries via bandar matlab machli patnam so for diamonds for the hyderabadi raw cotton textiles the sarees a bit of rice also used to go from i don't say only hyderabad dakkan region from this area 
so much so this much i remember in indonesia that time it was a hindu kingdom malaysia was a hindu kingdom my friends know your senior friends sorry king sanjay was a founder of the malay empire indonesian princess and affluent people so also the malay peninsular people they would wait for those sarees dhotis and other what you call the silk material which would come from bandar and also other east coast states only when the indian textile from dakkan from elsu when they come they would start their shubhalagnam or their bridal ceremony or marriage ceremonies so also having that connection with the pythonic sari which comes from another 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 textile called the pythonic could be pythoni or patani it will be called as pythoni yeah i had it's a old fort you know i'd been there cotton now why i'm trying to say is yeah in gujarat i am about i said i'm trying to relate to myself how as a landlocked deccani state of hyderabad kingdom would try to keep under its own control but that's not enough there used to be called the persian biolinguist in bandar machili patnam gold the persian carpets of course the spices from persia iran they would come directly to bandar puducherry pancherry krishnapatnam east coast narsi patnam and there are quite a few i will not go into details there used to be called dibashi biolinguist or bilinguist the persians when they come there the merchants they don't know local language telugu or whatever so these people used to be the translators or interlocutors telugu to persian persian to telugu that's what one thing that i'm trying to relate that's i told my delhi friend isliye to hai wo padhna padta hai apan hyderabad mein baith ke ocean ke bare mein ocean ko kya bolte i really don't know ocean ko kya bolte i asked my young friend come here my ne bola bhai samudra bolte nahi nahi samudra bhai the thairu bhai bhai puch ke aata hu uska arabi word kai bahar am i right somebody please correct me bahar or bahar what that was one link bandar bandar abbas then uh, golconda diamond that was the connection karwan was a very big business hub business center the nizam of hyderabad till recently had under his control this bandar machili patnam there is an indian ocean east indian ocean state called that time abyssinia now it's called mozambique that time there used to be arab both pailwan tall well built etc they had a relationship with the hyderabad nizam kingdom they were the, among the personal gods of the nizam of hyderabad they used to be called the abyssinian pailwans they came from mozambique the then abyssinia and all until the hyderabad kingdom was they were the elite now right what you call today nsg nation security gods of india they constituted the then personal gods of the nizam of hyderabad some of my friends who are hyderabadis like you will know there something can near nampalli railway station abyssinian lines those abyssinian lines was a residential area given by the nizam exclusively for his personal guards who came from mozambique i may share with my younger scholars here when portuguese came that fellow vasco da gama in his first attempt he lost the way how to come to india he came to mozambique already that was being ruled by an arab vasco da gama went and requested him i want to go to hindustan they would call spice land hindustan the portuguese and the europeans they say okay we have an arab fellow here who regularly between the malabar coast and cochin etc he regularly moves between our east coast with the mozambique he gave it was the mozambique arab who had known very well the west coast of india or the oceanography of india who had led the portuguese vasco da gama not knowing unfortunately 
Vasco de Gama will come here only with the evil intentions of one day imperially dominating and bringing the coast around under the Portuguese control. This is another example of how Deccani could be connected historically to the ocean, that means the Bahar around. The Nizam very much wanted in addition to the Machili Patanam, also Goa. He was not very successful. In the morning, Admiral Arun Prakash, or maybe somebody else was making a passing reference to the regular chronic battles between the Mysore kings or Hyder Ali and his son, and also the, the, what, the Maratha kings, the Peshwas, but later on the Europeans came. I mean, that's a big story by itself. I am sorry, I can't take you into, for this context, it may not be that relevant at all, but there always used to be a st struggle for power to control the Goa West Coast ports, and the Nizam of Hyderabad also tried. Yesterday itself, the Hindu newspaper carried in the Sunday that how the Nizam of Hyderabad wanted to bring under his control the port of Goa, Daman, Dayu, etc., but he did not succeed. But that I'm trying to tell you how the ocean hinterland connectivity, even not only today, to that point I shall come to you later on, was very much was a part of the geopolitical or power play between the rulers of the Deccan on the one hand and those who control the coast on the other hand. A little bit one or two more, I may say, in the manner of speaking and sharing with you, not very important here. Ajanta, Ellora, those who had been there and I had seen, particularly in Ajanta, not in Ellora, one cave particularly very visible, and still it's visible, rather intact, shows that the Persian merchants coming, bringing along with them certain gift, tofa, and trying to give it to Dakani kings so that they will be able to get what you call to the trading rights licenses in order to bring their trade, their goods into the Dakan and sell them. Lastly, not very important one or the other. There used to be a lady called Princess Nilofa. She was not a Hyderabadi. She was the niece, not a daughter, of last Khalifa of Turkey, Ada Khilafat, the Khalifa. She was the daughter-in-law of Mir Usman Ali Khan, the last Nizam of Hyderabad. Very charming, but also very nice lady, I believe. The Nizam was very, very happy with his daughter-in-law, but not with his son, her husband. It's a disturbed historical service. We have in Nampalli, very not far away from here, Princess Nilofar Hospital. She built it as a hospital exclusive for women and children. Princess Nilofar, that time, I don't think she had come early in the 19th century between Turkey, Istanbul, or Hyderabad. There were flights. Obviously, she must have come by ships, very well-built Turkey ships. Turkey dominated the entire Mediterranean Sea, so also the Persian Gulf sometimes she must have come by now. When the British and the Europeans defeated the last Khalifa in the First World War, the Nizam of Hyderabad offered him, I may say, asylum or shelter. He sent emissaries. Khalifa, in his own way, defeated though, but he was a big man. He very politely declined to come and settle in Hyderabad as the guest or, or what you call of the Nizam of Hyderabad. Those who can go or who had seen Hyderabadis and non-Hyderabadis, Salar Jang Museum is a window to Deccan's connectivity with the Indian Ocean around us in the past. That's enough to, it that explains everything, how one single man, Sir Salar Jang, had been able to collect so many things from Persia, Arab countries, Europe, and etc. The point that I'm trying to say is, ये तो मैं कहानी बताया था मेरे दिल्ली फ्रेंड को दोस्त इसलिए तो दक्कन वाले तो पढ़ना ही पड़ेगा सबूत के बारे में। I don't want to tell you the whole story here, but in the manner of speaking, 
of course maybe rather non contextual for this occasion i just wanted to relate to myself with you as a student of maritime studies the kind of the interconnectivity today we call connectivity between hinterland and the deccan not only ya usmania university charminar golgumbas of bijapur very well known manu university scholars i don't need to tell you who used to have persian art and architecture influence usmania university is an admixture of the persian culture which generally we call dakani art dakani culture dakani architecture how much more can i say because more i don't know anyway about the chemistry and all that because i have been only a student of maritime affairs and political science but not history anyway i would like to make a fool of myself publicly by speaking more about the subject about which i don't know more by virtue of my last three decades or so association with the indian ocean and maritime studies i thought why not i also look into the historical aspects of any kind of connectivity and the linkages that established these are some of the examples i thought i'll be share with you from here with the due permission of yours and the chair i may jump to you jump into the current context more particularly the 2023 for me as a student of indian ocean and maritime affairs more particularly with my country's growing involvement and convergence with the ocean around us 2023 has been a significant year from india's growing convergence with the indian ocean around us in the morning i was making a vague statement here in a passing manner the present development paradigm of india is blue economy and blue economy is nothing but how ocean and its resources can be factored into a country's development and growth paradigm that's what happening i mentioned some of the examples the policy initiatives that have been introduced by the government of india and in that context i may tell you this year 2023 rather outgoing at the penultimate beginning with may three or four ocean specific developments have taken place which have exact relevance to india's blue economy may 2023 the shipping minister of india goes to sitwe burma myanmar that's called the sitwe port that is part of the multi modal transport connectivity linking west bengal state of india kolkata and haldia ports by sea up to the coast of burma myanmar sitwe from there there is a river called kaledan that's the name of the burmese river the goods transported from kolkata port would go to sitwe from there they would be carried by river and up to a certain point and from there there is a burmese town or whatever the way road they go to mizoram aizwal and far beyond into other parts of northeastern india this is kaledan multi modal connectivity project way back in not very long ago it was originally scheduled to be completed somewhere in 2014 but there were some problems huge project is a multi modal project where india's bay of bengal east coast east coast economic corridor government of india had introduced under sagarmala and the haldia kolkata ports are being modernized and from there this kaledan multi modal project sea river and road three components are involved 
In May 2023, the port was completed with Indian money. And the Indian Minister for Shipping Ports, now it's also called Inland Ways, Inland Waterways, had gone there to receive the first cargo ship, Matlab vessel, carrying mercantile goods from Calcutta port to the Marmi Sitawe port in May 2023. My paper is in a manner of refreshing the minds of my people who are listening here, land sea connectivities. I don't think I have to make it too obvious to you say how East Coast land place sea is now connected via Burma to Northeastern Indian region. October 2023, a foreign ship comes, dock set, I'm sorry, it's a Malayali word, Vijayam, or Admiral Arun Prakash can correct me, sir. I don't know, I'm not able to mouth it. Vijayam in Kerala, not very far from the Cochin port, is India's first container and transshipment port. Government of India had identified three transshipment ports to be constructed, not yet over. Cochin, Vijayam, not very far from each other, and the one somebody was talking about the Greater Nicobar Development Project, which is not only about port. Greater Nicobar Project is a port to come a port city with many advanced state-of-the-art kind of the facilities, I believe. But port definitely is an important key component of the projected Greater Nicobar Project. So Greater Nicobar Port also is conceived as a transshipment port. These are three transshipment ports. Now, October 2023, the first foreign cargo ship comes and docks, and that was also received by the Chief Minister of Kerala. And which foreign country that ship belongs to? I don't know, either by sheer coincidence or by designation, there's a Chinese ship. October 2023. Two or three weeks later, I hear two or three more Chinese ships have come, not to India, but to Colombo, not very far away, just 29 kilometers from Rameshwaram across the Park Strait to the other side of the country. Now we see here, whatever my, the analysts might say, one Chinese ship coming apparently for commercial purposes to the Kerala transshipment port, and two or three more ports. They have been coming regularly last four to five Chinese ships for the so-called research. It's nothing but research. It's only espionage. We know it and how politics and trade could be related here. One thing I can tell you in this context, China was, to some extent, China is our largest trade partner. I may also have with hindsight, during the COVID period, the trade, bilateral trade figure between India and China went up, but did not go down. So when we are talking about China-India maritime relations, some of these things one can't, a good student, ignore them. And more of that one, I will not talk to you. And this happened, the Chinese civilian ship coming to Vijayam, October 2023. November 2023, Khulna is a railway station in Bangladesh, very close to India-Bangladesh border. And with the Indian support, it is Indian finance assistant, Khulna to Monga port in Bangladesh, about 60, 65 kilometers of railway line broadcast had been completed. About five or six years ago, Prime Ministers of India and Bangladesh signed an agreement that Bangladesh would allow the movement of Indian goods by rivers and to use 
थ्री पोर्ट्स ऑफ बांग्लादेश मोंगला आशगंज एंड ऑल्सो चिटागन वाई आई ट्राई टू लुक इन टू एवरीबडी नो दो नो नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडियन टोपोग्राफी इट टेक्स ह्यूज टाइम टू सेंड गुड्स फ्रॉम इंडिया वया सिलगुरी टू एदर मिजोरम और मणिपुर और वॉट यू कॉल एनी अदर आसाम एक्सेट्रा इट कट्स टाइम कास्ट एवरी थिंग इज द सेम गुड्स आर ट्रांसपोर्टेड वया बांग्लादेश एंड रिवर्स नाउ दैट इज बींग डन मोंगला पोर्ट ऑफ बांग्लादेश आशगंज ए रिवर पोर्ट चिटगंग बांग्लादेश मोस्ट वेरी कल बिजी पोर्ट एंड द लार्जेस्ट पोर्ट गुड्स आर ऑलरेडी ट्रांसपोर्टेड फ्रॉम चिटगंग टू नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न इंडिया एंड इन नवंबर दिस मंथ 2023 ट्वेंटी थ्री वॉट यू कॉल विजुअली ऑनलाइन प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ इंडिया प्राइम मिनिस्टर ऑफ बांग्लादेश फॉर्मली इनाग्रेटेड द फर्स्ट मूवमेंट ऑफ कंसाइनमेंट फ्रॉम कुलना टू मोंगला पोर्ट नाउ इट इज से फ्रॉम मोंगला पोर्ट इट इज मच ईजियर टू सेंड गुड्स टू आसाम त्रिपुरा एंड अदर नॉर्थ ईस्ट इंडियन स्टेट्स एंड द लास्ट वन एज आई वॉज कमिंग टूडे गेटिंग प्रिपेयर टू कम टू दिस कॉन्फ्रेंस द हिंदू हेडलाइन कैरीज द किंग ऑफ भूटान हु इज नव इन इंडिया एंड प्राइम मिनिस्टर मोदी हैव अग्रीड दे आर फर्दर गोइंग टू एनहेंस कनेक्टिविटीज रोड रेल लिंकेजेस बिटवीन द टू कंट्रीज दे आर ऑल्सो एडेड वन मोर दैट मीन्स बोथ कंट्रीज अग्रीड दैट वे आर बांग्लादेश भूटान इज गुड्स अप एंड डाउन वुड बी मूव मोर फैस्टर India agreed. Monga port or any other port in Bangladesh can be facilitated to move goods. Friends, May, October, November, November of today. These four I am trying to connect to myself to the topic of day. How do we visualize them? And going back to my own, the familiar thesis that India no. not only india the bay of bengal countries around on the east coast including the northeastern states there is a growing compulsion i would say and also consciousness the sea around should be factored more eminently into the development process of be it bangladesh or sri lanka or myanmar or for that matter any other bay of bengal country of course india would be paying obviously and inescapably a preeminent role in trying to connect i would rather foresee if not prematurely that bay of bengal region is going to be in future of course contingent upon several socio economic and political factors as a bay of bengal growth triangle or a growth pole some of those my friends who may not be sufficiently knowledgeable i may say over the last since 1997 the first and most important multilateral subregional cooperation agreement was signed that is called bimstek is very difficult for me i am a bit nervous they de abbreviate them because more so ambassador devore who was involved in what you call finalization of the bimstek agreement and i would like to what you call give a faltered de abbreviated expression to bimstek but this much i can say in bimstek bangladesh myanmar sri lanka nepal bhutan and of course myanmar and thailand not of the south asian countries or south east asian countries are members in them connectivity between the bay of bengal countries by road by rail and by sea physical connectivity in order to enhance trade commerce tourism people to people connection and why and many things this is an important original seven agendas this is one of the important one and i see 
though rather belatedly and slowly, that the BIMSTEC agenda of physically connecting in a multimodal fashion the Bay of Bengal countries, including the two landlocked countries, Bhutan and Nepal, it is on the move. There is another sub-regional cooperation called BBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, and Nepal. Not much has gone down over that one, but as I said today, through these four incidents I have mentioned to you this year itself, Bhutan, Bangladesh, India, Northeastern Indian region are connected. Long ago, South Asian countries, SARC, agreed on South Asian Growth Quadrangles, SCAGQ. Unfortunately, because of the known fractured relationship and lack of mutual trust between the South Asian countries, the South Asian Growth Quadrangle could not take off. But in that one, involving the Bay of Bengal countries is the prime objective. These three or four incidents of 2023 the connectivities, multi-model connectivities that I have talked to you about, they are, there is no finality to them. They are only, perhaps I could say, beginning. One or two things I may talk to you, if the chairperson would allow me to say, take a little more time. The, there is something called trilateral highway connecting from Gohoti, northeastern India, neighboring Myanmar, and Thailand. 1,300 kilometers of only road called Trilateral Highway, I may say for the sake of convenience, TH. It was supposed to be completed long, long ago, but given the very difficult terrain of the Garo Hills and all the Northeast Indian forests, gorges, etc. Obviously, it could not be completed. This is also, of course, not only this, the difficult terrain, but the chronic insurgent, the turbulent situation is there, which you know, I know it very well. I happened to be in Delhi for a Beamstech conference, and one of the former Indian ambassadors to Burma, I asked him, sir, what is the progress of TH? He said, look, Ra, we have two problems. One is terrain, the other problem is the chronic insurgent problem. Local Burmese insurgents, they are not allowing this TH highway to proceed because they have their own problem with the military junta. One has to accept. I mean, when you talk about the connectivity by sea or road, trading relations or tourism, it's not just a hairy fairy story. Ultimately, it is the political terrain, the type of the governance or misgovernance. And we all know Manipur, Mizoram, and Myanmar, these three bordering areas and states have been having. Even today, I was reading China is requesting Myanmar government to maintain stability in northern Myanmar. China does not have to request Myanmar anymore. China dictates to Myanmar the way Chinese influence is so deep strategically, politically, and economically. The problem is, is when we talk about regional economic cooperation and land sea connectivity is an inescapable component of the regional economic cooperation or Bay of Bengal economic cooperation. Now, what counts is many. The local law, regional stability, security order, including maritime security order, the internal governance, stability or instability of a particular country like Burma and our own northeastern region. These are the conditions on which the regional cooperation and land sea connectivity is contingent upon. We can't just talk about drawing the plan that they have to be. For that reason, what I'm trying to say, trilateral highway that I'm talking to you about has been delayed. So what's the future for this one? Northeastern India, Burma, and Thailand 
what I hear is, I have gone to a more reliable latest report written by ORF Observer Research Foundation, Delhi based its branches in Calcutta. Even I was involved in the Calcutta branch at one time, and they informed 70% of the completion of the trilateral highway at this Indian component is over. Only that Myanmar's component is remaining, the Thai component is also over. Now what do we say here? That means Kaledan is partly over, TH 70% is over. Now we have seen also here the Kulna, Manga, etc., Chittagong, they are already operational. And the foreign, though Chinese port, I mean, the ship has come to one of a transshipment force. And in the same year, somewhere in September or so, I'm sorry, I forgot on the month, but in 2023, from what we call Nagapattinam near Kanyakumari port city to <coughs> Kankasanturai is another port near Jaffna, in Jaffna area, a ferry had been introduced. Some of my Dakkan students here, I may remind you, there used to be for a very long time during the Chola, Pallava, or British and other areas, there used to be a regular ferry, ferries rather, running across the Park Strait and Gulf of Manamar. There used to be, the, during the colonial period, there was a ferry service called Chidambaram. But during the, because of the LTT insurgency, whatever that may be, Chidambaram service had been stopped. Later on, they wanted to renew it, some local problems. Now, instead of Chidambaram, now this service, what the Nagapattinam to the Kankasanturai. Kankasanturai was a port, not very big one, very small one, but during the terrorist period in Jaffna area, it was totally damaged. But I may tell you, in 2009, once the LTTU movement came to an end, it was Indian government which has once again restored the Palai airport in Jaffna area as also the Kankasantra airport in that one. This much I know, the Indian Coast Guard particularly and some of the Indian maritime technologists and technicians, they had extended a lot of support in restoring Kankasantra. Somebody was talking in the morning, why not we share with uh, marine capability, skills, training, etc. Sir, we have been sharing what we call in the language of maritime studies, maritime soft power. With more than 30 countries of the Indian Ocean region to the east and west, Indian Navy, Indian Coast Guard, national, what you call in the Goa-based uh, research service, NIOT, they are all in their own way training the marine civilian military services of several Indian Ocean countries, of which more recently introduced by the Indian Navy, International Fusion Center and Indian Ocean is the most recent one. I may say, rather, that the Bay of Bengal countries are forging, and forging very rapidly. India definitely is playing a very important role in this one. It's because India has her own, like other Bay of Bengal countries, economic interests, but also strategic interests. The Chinese, I'm sorry if I may sound a little, little more harsh here, they have virtually taken over, thank you, much earlier I'll do it, that the Bay of Bengal economies, politics, they have gone under the carpet of the Chinese. China-Pakistan economic corridor, China-Myanmar economic corridor, China-Nepal economic corridor, and about Sri Lanka, I don't have to tell you, maybe because of the Chinese economic domination, Hambantota, Colombo, etc., the Lankan economy has gone deep down into the Samudram. That means that is an abyss. Bangladesh government openly said last year, we do not want to depend anymore on the Chinese financial assistance. I hope other governments also say it one day. But it is here where 
we the Indians have the opportunity. All that I want to say in the concluding manner is economics and geopolitics are involved in the momentum in trying to build connectivities or the linkages between the Indian Peninsula and the other Bay of Bengal neighboring countries around us like the beamstick. Thank you all. We'll have question and answer session after the second lecture. Uh, so we'll move on to the second lecture now. Uh, the second lecture is by Professor Krishnendra Mena. Before inviting him, a few words about him. Professor, Professor Krishnendra Mena has a PhD in International Relations from Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He currently holds the post of Professor, Center for Study of Regional Development, School of Social Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University. And he is also Secretary General, Society for Indian Ocean Studies. He specializations on the topics of geopolitics, Indian Ocean, borders, and BRICS. He has published on these topics in leading international journals and regularly contributes to news magazines. He is, of, he is author of the book titled British Geopolitics in the South Atlantic. Professor Mina has been visiting fellow at the BRICS Policy Center, Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. He regularly participates in international and national conferences. Now I request Professor Krishnendra Meena to deliver his lecture on geopolitical significance of India, Middle East, European Economic Corridor. Uh, at the outset, let me thank uh, the HK Sirwani Center for Deccan Studies and more specifically uh, Professor Salma Ahmed Faruqi for having us here, for having the society here. And uh, uh, I'm speaking after uh, speakers of repute, Prof, uh, Ambassador Devre, Admiral Anu Prakash, and now Professor P.V. Rao. So I doubt whether I'll be able to fulfill the uh, task ahead of me to present a topic which is a very recent one, and so much so recent that it is not even two months old. I'll try to make sense of what I understand of this topic and where does IMAC or IMEC stand in the larger geopolitical literature uh, which is available to us or what are its implications for us in the uh, living in India and or in general what are the geopolitical specific geopolitical implications so let me give a brief, brief background to what has happened very recently we had this uh, G20 summit in India one of the achievements or as it has been touted is a joint declaration of the G20 which is uh, an achievement because an agreement was reached between the warring parties east of Europe. Uh, so NATO was included. So there was a balance, which a balanced document which came out and which included viewpoints from Russia, Russia and China on the one side, the NATO on the other side regarding this uh, conflict waging uh, in the east of Europe. So it was a difficult task achieved very well by Indian diplomats as well as uh, another JNUIT was involved in it, uh, the Su Sherpa Amitabh Kant, uh, the Se Sherpa, G20 Sherpa uh, Amitabh Kant was in it. And uh, it is argued that this, uh, the second achievement was of course the, uh, an announcement of uh, IMAC, plus there were other uh, agreements which were reached like uh, 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 like the lifestyle for sustainable development and uh, there is this, uh, 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 that is called LIFE. Then there is Green Biofuels Alliance, which was announced. So now, uh, among them, an important one was IMEEC. So in general, this, this holds a very important part of that success of G20, this recent summit in G20. Uh, a number of scholars, a number of uh, uh, commentators have argued that this is a response to the Belt and Road Initiative which was spoken uh, about by Admiral Prakash in the morning. Uh, but the, the base or the roots of this IMAC was, were already laid in the preceding G7 summit which happened in uh, Japan in July. Because uh, there, was, there is something called Partnership for Global Infrastructure Initiative which was announced there by the United States and the G7 countries, which was actually to rival the Belt and Road Initiative where there is a lot of heavy Chinese investment, infrastructure investment. So that formed the basis of this IMAC, which was later announced in uh, G20. It was, uh, if you look at the constituting con component countries, 
uh, it is uh, mainly India, Saudi Arabia, United States, Israel and across the Mediterranean it is EU. It is also important for us to understand that why we are facing these, uh, why there is a, a, a lot of uh, apprehension about IMAC after the uh, 7th October attack on Israel by Hamas and the, uh, the response by Israel. It is because of the fact that there are already a number of ports which, in, which are located in Syria and Lebanon which are doing the work through the pipelines which run from uh, the Gulf to the Mediterranean ports and then they transport oil and natural gas through the Mediterranean towards Europe. So it is not only, I am not relating directly to directly the conflict to this event, to this IMAC, but there is, there were already existing ports which were doing the work, that work, which is uh, wherein uh, I think uh, uh, IMAC will, rep some part of it will be replaced by the Haifa, Haifa port. It will be taken by the port in Israel. So there is this uh, economic dimension also, which is also troubling to uh, some Arabic countries. So uh, that's a direct link. Uh, so there is this port in uh, Syria called Banias, Banias or there is Sidon and Beirut in Lebanon. These three ports are directly impacted by the ports in uh, Israel. So that's a little background to what is the, what are the, uh, say, the connectivity implications for the and already there are a number of pipelines, for example, the Trans-Arabic Pipeline, which reaches to these ports. Then there are uh, more pipelines which run from UAE to the Mediterranean ports, which supply oil and natural gas. And since it is also an energy flow, mainly an energy flow uh, corridor, it, they will be impacted. And the direct impact will be on these ports, uh, economically and connectivity-wise. So the, and the only factor I... Uh, uh, I can say is that the pipelines are now being replaced by an India-made uh, railway line, the railway track. So that will be a major change, I think, in the in the context of, uh, if even if you look at the map, which I'll show it to you later, the only change which is coming is that of the uh, railway line, which will, which will be laid by India. Apart from that, the, uh, the sea routes remain the same. A little shift from Suez Canal, but Suez has already been there and the shift is, major shift is the shift from pipeline to the railway line. Uh, that is the main shift happening in the Middle East and that is uh, an important component of this uh, IMAC. Uh, for, for, these are the countries which are directly, uh, have direct implications by this, uh, by this, by IMAC. India, of course, is, uh, uh, as, uh, is the terminal point in the east, Europe being the terminal point in the west. The countries were named in the morning. Again, I, I, I just mentioned some of them, but rather than... Uh, uh, so, Greece is the, uh, the end of this multi-border transport network in the Mediterranean, and through there, it will be the European network of uh, various transport mechanisms, transport uh, mode, modes, which will take over. But... Middle East and West, West Asia it will be directly impacted, as I just explained in the through this network of pipelines. Maybe a little this, they may lose a little business owing to this new upcoming railway line. Mediterranean countries, Turkey has reservations about this uh, IMAC, so but it has always been uh, has been a voice despite being in the NATO. They have always been. Uh, uh, alone, sometimes uh, 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 vo voice which has dissented a lot, even in NATO. So that is one voice which directly says that this, this is not uh, uh, a very welcoming uh, proposition for us. Then uh, other Mediterranean countries are going to benefit. Apart from Greece, there will be some ports of Italy which will be handling some cargo from, uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from the IMAC. Then if you look at the larger uh, picture, it, the idea of Indo-Pacific is will also be impacted. As I said in the beginning, the idea, the the G7 idea comes from Jap this PGII idea comes from Japan, and it, I think, in my understanding, the connectivity part of Indo-Pacific is somehow addressed by this partnership for uh, global infrastructure investment. So that component is there, and when we speak of Indo-Pacific, when we speak of PGII, we have to consider that quad 
plays a very important role in both uh, G20 as well as in the G, uh, uh, the three main actors in Quad, a uh, two main actors in Quad play an important role in G7. So it's a larger uh, idea, larger brand. Uh, we also understand that this uh, revitalizing of the term Indo-Pacific, as Admiral pointed out during the morning, is an American exercise. If we go back to the history of Indo the term Indo-Pacific, it has very, very problematic roots. It's a, it's, an, uh, it's a term which has Nazi roots. So a Nazi geographer, Karl Hoshofer, was the one who used the term for, his idea was that when the Japanese leave the Southeast Asian countries, it will be the Germans who will occupy, and he called it as the Indo-Pacific space. Prior to that, the Dutch called it the Indo-Pacific space, but mainly it was Hoshofer who used it, geopolitically so and he but now it so happens that this term is taken up by the americans and the japanese and they are now actually publicizing it so much that asia pacific the term asia pacific is not in use anymore and indo pacific is being used uh, i also can say, uh, say about this very clearly because i wrote a paper about it about the specific term indo pacific going back to its roots in the 18th century so that's the term has that long roots, but it is, it is a revival of that term now. And for particular geopolitical, uh, and that's a practice in, uh, I think, uh, to uh, provide nomenclature, this, this, this is called uh, geopolitical coding in a geopolitics language. So now the area has been code, code, uh, coded as Indo-Pacific, and the elements which are beneficial to certain parties who have coined this term will gradually start falling into place. So the jigsaw puzzle has been created and the puzzle will be filled up by, and that has been a practice for a long time by the Europeans. They, they name a place and accordingly they build, they build uh, the infrastructure around it and they build various facilities around it so that it keep, and the, the, the whole narrative is built around it. And similar, that is what has happened in the case of Indo-Pacific also. So, and uh, without being critical of it, one can say that it will last for a long time. It is going to last for a long time now. The US has named its command zone uh, after Indo-Pacific. So they have now I think uh, the PACOM has been named as Indo-PACOM, uh, the US Indo-Pacific Command. So the, the, it has a larger geopolitical picture and IMAC is a small part of this larger geopolitical canvas which is being painted by the United States and its allies. Uh, that's very, very clear. Uh, and India has a role to play in it. Th that's, and that's where IMAC is an important, uh, 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 important way to, uh, for India to like, uh, be more closer or to project itself in the larger Indo-Pacific uh, domain. If you look at India's engagement with Indo-Pacific on the eastern flank, as has been mentioned, India has been constantly making progress through the look east and act east policy. This is on the western flank that uh, the, first, the first opportunity has come for India to express itself through these multimodal projects. Uh, multimodal projects were spoken up by Professor P. V. R. Rao also, but this is the first multimodal project for India on its western side. Then uh, this has also implications for Asian century because uh, again it was uh, uh, the Secretary of State Hillary Clinton who argued that it is going to, in 2011 who argued that it is going to be an uh, Asian century and what better way to create these infrastructure projects to fund these infrastructure pro projects and make it a, an Asian century. This, is, this goes back and this, this, this has been a constant United States policy for the last two decades or so, since, uh, so and that has been coming to fruition now. Uh, the challenges for this corridor come from these three main actors, Turkey, Iran and China. As uh, these small states of Syria and Lebanon are impacted by losing business to these railway lines uh, or to Haifa, the, the Haifa port in Israel. Similarly, Iran is also losing uh, some weightage, if not uh, directly losing business, it is also lo losing uh, weightage in the, region, in the region. Iran is undoubtedly a regional actor, an important regional actor in uh, West Asia or Middle East. And it has uh, a certain amount of weightage in affairs in the Middle East. Though it has been portrayed in many ways from various quarters, uh, mainly Europeans have portrayed it in a different light. 
Americans portray it as a pariah state and create, a, this, create this whole narrative about Iran. Iran. But for, from the Indian perspective, Iran has, been, has always been an important partner culturally as well as economically it has been very important for India. So, and I think uh, that's why this challenge is seen from Iran. Iran is, uh, is doubtful or it is apprehensive of this larger uh, uh, IMEC project and it has opposed it. It has uh, uh, clearly said that this is not going to work in this region. And uh, uh, Turkey for its uh, reservations against NATO, reservations against the European Union, as well as more recently if you look at uh, uh, Turkey's uh, uh, statements over Indian uh, projects, they have been mostly negative. So that, if that plays, I, uh, I wonder if that plays uh, onto the minds of the Turkish, if when India is involved into a project, they have to oppose it or if that is the case, then it is there. But in general, it has been opposed to NATO in, as I said in the beginning, it has been a dissenting voice in the NATO, as well as they have been opposing what EU has to say. EU always have kept them as a candidate state. They have never accepted them as a, a European, uh, as a part of the European Union. They, they have given them a candidate state and the, it, will, it is going to remain uh, like that for another 50 years. 50 years have lapsed. Another 50 years it will be like that. I guess uh, uh, President Erdogan recognizes that and constantly issues these statements. China though has welcomed the project because it replicates what they have been doing uh, with the BRI but argues uh, but says that it should not become a geopolitical tool. On the other hand, the BRI itself is a geopolitical tool. So the Chinese do not contribute much to this debate on whether IMAC is an important uh, is a, is a way forward or what, what is it? They, they I think are in the wrong when they come on, comment upon the IMAC because they have been doing the same things for the last two, one and a half uh, uh, cent, uh, decade. For 15 years now, I think uh, BRI was two, uh, for a decade now, 2013 to 23. So they have been doing the same things. So uh, nonetheless, the Chinese as the rising superpower and uh, a rising military power on, or an established military power are opposing that. Their influence in Gulf is, their stock and influence in the Gulf, in Western uh, Arabian Sea or in general in the Indian Ocean is constantly increasing. And that is increasing for the last two decades. So they have to some, in some way respond to such uh, announcements by the G20 or wherever uh, Europeans and the Americans are involved. That's natural for them. Uh, this is the map of uh, uh, the uh, IMAC. If you look at, uh, there is the only uh, part which is new is uh, uh, the proposed railway line. Rest of the routes are already existing. Uh, the sea routes in Mediterranean as well as in the uh, Arabian Sea are already existing ones. So the difference is the railway line which will be constructed through UAE, Israel, oh sorry, UAE, uh, Saudi Arab and leading, going into Israel and from there the port of Haifa and from there it will, the goods will be transported, goods and commodities will be transported again on the ships to Europe. So there is not... Uh, oh, sorry, I do not know, sir. <laughs> Which one to press now? The same one? Yes, ah, it's okay. So this is India, and these are the railway lines, the red ones, and the other ones are uh, existing marine, marine routes here. Uh, that's the maximum. But it is uh, okay. Let me give you the source. This is from Money Control. That's a website run by Reliance Industries. So money control, you can go to money control and find this map, right? I have borrowed it from money control. Now, let us also look at, as a scholar of geopolitics, let us also look at how do uh, the geo traditional classical geopolitical thinkers would have rated IMAC. For Admiral Mahan, it's a natural outcome of uh, a rising, uh, or uh, uh, na natural outcome for any strong navy. So his idea was command of the sea to gain uh, through naval superiority and to control the trade and commercial routes. That was his main idea. And in that, I think uh, uh, 
it plays an iMac fits the bill perfectly from the Indian point of view, from the uh, the West Asian point of view, as well as from the European perspective. They will all, they will be controlling this. Uh, up, up, uh, the only difference being that it is not a totally C route. It is it is a uh, combination of modes of transport. So that is the difference. People know Holford Mackinder as a person who spoke of heartland and the geographical pivot of history as a land power theorist. But whenever he spoke of India, he wrote only about sea power. And he acknowledged Mahan's version of sea power and argued that uh, the Indian Ocean plays a very important role in the larger construction of empire. The Indian ports are the, are the connecting nodes in this network which provide the main impetus to the larger empire. And he, at, in one of his papers, it is called Britain and the British Seas. Not a, it's a book uh, from 1910. He argues that Colombo is the center of all communications of the world where all routes converge. And the other center is for him is Mumbai. So Mumbai being one of the important parts of it plays again a very important role. He also links within his larger construction when he speaks of Colombo and Mumbai, he also linked in uh, close to a century ago, he links the safety and security in the Mediterranean to the Indian Ocean and Southeast Asia and East Asia because it was through that route that the British were conducting their trade through Suez Canal, Arabian Sea and towards East Asia. So that was a very, uh, that template is now visible in IMAC. And uh, uh, it is. It can also be said that if India is able to connect these ports, the eastern co east, uh, western ports to eastern ports, with the use of uh, expressways, it can become a faster route. Rather than circumventing the peninsula, this can become a faster route to reach the east, uh, eastern ports and further uh, eastwards towards Southeast Asia. That can be be a faster route. Uh, there have been, uh, I think, pro projects and ideas which have tried to link, uh, try to uh, create an uh, expressway through Bangladesh from West Bengal towards, uh, through the northeast, the eastern, the part of India which is east of Bangladesh towards Myanmar. So that exercise is also, can also become a meaningful exercise if these ports are connected to this highway which can be built across uh, the peninsula towards Bangladesh and further towards uh, Southeast Asia. IMAC could really be uh, become uh, very fruitful if these, uh, highway this highway network is, uh, becomes, uh, is realized or materialized. Uh, another traditional geopolitical thinker or classical geopolitical thinker, Nicholas Spikeman, argued that there is a circumferential maritime highway around the Eurasian landmass. And that was what, that was, uh, this highway was used during the containment period by the USA to contain the Soviet Union. And this maritime, circumferential maritime highway can again be useful if we visualize uh, the IMAC. And uh, this again, uh, it it's fits very well with his version in, uh, which came out during the Second World War. He, he was uh, writing in 1943 and speaking of the circumferential maritime highway, which became very useful for the pe for people uh, uh, in the United States uh, government during the Cold War. And so if you look at the United States' allies during the Cold War, they were along this maritime highway, which is surrounding the uh, Eurasian continent, Eurasian landmass, not continent, but so beginning from Sweden to NATO. I am talking about the geopolitics of it. That's why this slide is named geopolitics. And I speak as a geopolitic, <laughs> this is about geopolitics. So uh, that's, uh, that's also uh, was a very geopolitical uh, uh, say construct in his mind. Another uh, traditional geopolitical thinker who has for long advised the United States government, Saul B. Cohen, he argues that there are two arcs of instability. Uh, one is Middle East and the South Asia uh, is the second arc of instability owing to two disputes, two major disputes. One is 
uh, Israel pitted against the larger Arab world in West Asia and the second he calls South Asia also as an arc of instability because of the dispute between India and Pakistan in the uh, in Kashmir and uh, but uh, all of it but and this this uh, all these ideas have an origin in European and American literature and from their perspective uh, somehow these, if we look at their literature on say uh, uh, the uh, security strategy was mentioned in the morning. If you look at their literature, undoubtedly Admiral Mahan's work will somehow be informing that strategy, if not directly. In, uh, and, uh, 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 in many ways, Mackinder still informs the European mentality towards Russia. Uh, and uh, 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 Spikeman's works still inform uh, countries like even countries like China, they study them deeply and uh, and try to replicate what the West had done during the 20th century. So that's how uh, I think all of them uh, have, uh, in my understanding, there is a certain geopolitics of I IMAC which is uh, reflective of these ideas, which were very 20th century ideas, and still uh, I think. Uh, hold some uh, value in these developments. Thank you. We have one more speaker who would be joining online very shortly. But before that, we'll take up the question and answer session. My question is first to my friend, uh, Professor Meena, Krishnendra Meena. Uh, uh, wonderful presentation, Krishna, wonderful presentation. Especially I would like to know from you, what's your read? What did you read into the current uh, Israel, Hamas, the spillover effect on IMEC. One, I would like to know from you, because I know you have been studying geopolitics for long. So, I want to know a little Next is, other flashpoints of the globe, let's say. We have a few other flashpoints, let's say, Israel-Palestine is one, as you said, Indo-Pak is one, let's say, North Korea, South Korea, or China, Taiwan, like there are other couple of things like. But especially on Israel-Palestine, geopolitics, I make number one. Number two, I would like to know from you, uh, according to you, is it a befitting reply to BRI or are we still in the process of making a kind of a rebuttal or a you know befitting reply diplomatically, strategically, uh, uh, you know, Otherwise, also to the Chinese enlargement, entrapment, encirclement in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, so, BRI ka dasa lo gaya abhi. Mere kaya alze. Dasa lo gaya. BRI initiated. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so uh, please uh, 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 comment on this also. This, this aspect also. Thank you. And proceed to P.V. Rao, sir. Uh, wonderful presentation, sir. Uh, I would like to know from you, sir, uh, you specifically mentioned about the, actually the Indian Ocean, you have been involved in Indian Ocean studies for long uh, as a scholar and you know all that. So, Todasa, if you can spare some time on the strategic significance of the Andaman Nicobar into the overall you know, this thing. Because there are some doubts and concerns on the environmental side of whatever government of India wants to do in Andaman Nicobar. I mean, last year I was there in Andaman Nicobar, but I was there interacting with other uh, civilian police, not with the coast. I mean, I, in fact, I visited Coast Guard also, but uh, that part of aside, uh, the, uh, so much of money is being poured now into Andaman and Nicobar for various reasons. So, throw some light on the strategic space or circles. Andaman's significance in the overall Indo-Pacific, you know, that kind of angle. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, thank you, Ramesh. Uh, I have known Ramesh for a long time, so what, uh, I, I did explain to a certain extent about the spillover effect of this uh, conflict between Israel and Hamas on IMAC, but uh, there have been statements from all sides regarding IMAC after the conflict started. For example, Biden on, in his own uh, way is, you all understand that it, he has this geriatric streak where he loses his mind and utters nonsense. 
but he said, said something about IMAC and he said that uh, IMAC, uh, the conflict is a result of IMAC and then he retracted, retracted this statement saying that it will have an impact on IMAC. But, and then further later on went on to explain that we might be able to uh, say negate the effect of this conflict on IMAC. This is separate and so there were multiple uh, this thing. On the other hand, uh, Prime Minister Modi also issued a statement, but uh, regarding in, the, in support of IMAC and argued that th he inaugurated like uh, 12,000 crore worth, rupees worth of projects uh, in a po uh, from a, this Global Maritime Summit 2023, very recent. So this is like some a week or two ago. So there are, after that, and then these are the two main statements which have come out in support or say to, uh, after the IMAC, uh, the announcement of IMAC and the Israel Hamas, Hamas conflict. But long term, I believe that it, it will uh, work out because of the investment, which opportunities, for example, for India, there are huge investment opportunities in the Middle East. Uh, furthermore, the support, as long as it is across the Mediterranean, it is coming from Europe and the uh, North Americans. Apart from this conflict, what else could go wrong, right? And that's this only if only this conflict could derail the derail this project of such magnitude and such geopolitical significance. Then I cannot say much. Uh, if it is a response to BRI, I cannot say befitting reply, but I think uh, uh, what is ha so the PGII, the partnership for global infrastructure investment is a response to BRI from the G7. It is uh, to say that IMAC is a response to that. IMAC is a small part of that response, a larger response. In any case, the BRI's scale is huge, right? It is, uh, and it is, uh, it is, uh, though um, most of, a number of projects are running late, over budgeted and so on, uh, but uh, still early days for uh, us to comment on whether this is a suitable response to BRI. Thank you, Dr. Ramesh. When we talk about Andaman Nicobar factoring into overall India's Indian Ocean maritime strategy, <coughs> there are quite a few issues involved here, only from a strategic point of view. Malacca Strait, whether we like it or not, geographically extremely close to our own Andaman Nicobar, we know that Indira Point which is just about 80 or 90 kilometers from the Indonesian Sumatra itself. The Indian naval community generally wants to see that our uh, maritime security responsibility also will extend to the Malacca state also, obviously given the proximity, the compulsion of the security proximity. But uh, as I wrote it in my book on India's naval diplomacy, Malacca state countries are not willing to allow India, for that matter, any country, neither India, nor China, nor America, nor Japan, to leave the security responsibility or control over Malacca state to any foreign country, to this extent, but not beyond that one. So that to the extent that the Malacca powers are willing to give allowance to Indian Navy and also Coast Guard to extend our security facilities to them, oh, we, are, we are able to. Uh, that's one thing. Second thing is, but long, long ago, if you may recall, we have introduced somewhere in 1995 or 1994 Milan. MILA in Milan is actually, you know, is the Urdu or Mulahat meeting, conclave of the regional navies. It just started to five navies, but today we have, sorry, can't you, 13 or 14 countries, including Australian Navy is participating in It's a very friendly naval exercises. They call it naval, like a tabletop exercises, wherein we just friendly but a lot of exchange of the views takes place. We have been in the forefront of offering HADR, Humanitarian Assistance and Disaster Relief, Tsunami, Cyclone, 
I don't know, nature has caused the Bay of Bengal region uh, that uh, chronic, now it starts with November, Bay of Bengal region is known for chronic storms, cyclones and etc. I wonder, somebody would uh, correct me, some of our maritime historians, geographers have developed a hypothesis. India is very fortunate to have the kind of the maritime geography, but going by the kind of the day in and daytime kind of the natural and human disasters around our coast. I don't know, nature has blessed us or nature has cursed India in having this kind of a geography. I'm sorry, I'm no geographer, but we are always in the forefront whenever there's a cyclonic, stormy attack on any Bay of Bay countries. I remember, with due respect to Admiral Arun Prakash here, he sharing once with me, when tsunami broke in December 24 to 25th, 2004, the Indian naval people were ready to go to the rescue of Indonesia, no, not only Indonesia, Thailand, Burma, and etc. But there was some kind of a precondition that time, I don't know now. To go to any country, the Indian naval captain has to take permission from the Ministry of External Affairs. I remember, correct me, sir, you shared with me, you were ready with your ship to go to the help of Indonesia. Uh, I don't know that, but uh, I have seen you with your photo in one of the books published by the Indian Navy. You were a commodore or captain that time, I don't remember. That point is, that time you were chief, sorry, I stand corrected, 2004. So the point is, we do realize, and why not? The entire Bay of Bengal region, right up to Malacca State, given the kind of the both the security and trade, etc., compulsions that we need to have our own. Whether the present what greater Nicobar development project, whatever you may call, how much is involved in that one, both trade and strategic. Uh, sir was saying in the morning that you, whether it's viable or not is still a question. But I spoke to some other naval officers, friends of mine, sir. There are one section of the naval community invites that we need to have some kind of a static presence in the Nicobar. Some say that uh, we have at Port Blair already an integrated tri-service command. Why do we need again? I can't go, I'm not a competent man to all that one. But in general, I am happy about my country. We do not have maritime border dispute called IMB, International Maritime Border, with any country in the Bay of Bengal region. The only hitch was what was the exclusive economic zone, continental shelf dispute in Bangladesh and ours. We went to the court, the court had given, and we have decided to stand by abide by the verdict given by the International Court on the India-Bangladesh continent. At least one naval officer told me we have not really put across very strongly our case between the court, but that's a different matter. Thank you for the question. I'm Professor Srilata from Osmania University. I would like to ask a question to Professor Menon. In your presentation, sir, you have used the word that Indo-Pacific is predominantly used now. But when we look in the Southeast Asian countries in the Far East, we are not using this concept of Indo-Pacific mostly or prominently. We are having China putting forward mostly as Asia-Pacific. I would like to comment on this, like how far can India go forward to assert itself in this region or make this concept of Indo-Pacific more prominent? And the second question is to Professor P. V. Rao, sir. Sir, we are talking of maritime history and maritime consciousness in the Indian region or in the Indian Ocean region. So I would request you to tell me how the limitations could be addressed, especially when we are talking of maritime history. Uh, are we doing a mistake in our trying to identify the maritime history from the perspective of India or should we look at the history from the Southeast Asian countries? Maybe it's, there is a certain gap where we are not really 
getting the full information or uh, full content how history has unfolded in this region. Yeah. Yeah, generally we are looking at a certain aspect from the cultural aspect and all that. From the political perspective, maybe we have to dig in more from the other countries rather than from India. And for that, I think we need to have more interaction with these countries from the historical perspective. So from the academic point of view, sir. Yeah. So I would request the other two speakers also if you can address on it. Thank you. And the thing is that... Uh when I was looking at this from a non-academic viewpoint, when you put up the map, if you can put up the map again, the association map, with the shipping routes and all of that, you see, we seem to be moving away from the object of this uh, seminar that we're having, where we're looking at uh, Deccan as a hub from the point of view of revisiting maritime history to assess how do we evolve going forward and how do we assess the current accessibility that Deccan Plateau has based on the past, on the history, the present and the future. Now, beautifully covered by Professor Meena and uh, uh, referred back in history when we were just talking about India and Indian Ocean and the rest of the stories here, including connection to the older, uh, older civilization as well as our maritime trade was concerned. But what is relevant now to look at, when I look at the map that you presented over there, is can I get back the the assessment and the understanding of India's connectivity, which used to be one third of the global economic uh, GDP of, this, of the world. Obviously, there was a lot of logistics happening around there and a lot of coming in and going out. If I treat India as a black box for trading and for, for commerce and business, as well as uh, sciences, a lot of traffic was coming in and going out and that essentially was made accessible by, by a number of issues, including maritime trade, culture, wars, etc., security. Now, security is one part of the whole story, but if you really look at what has driven the ability of various communities and countries to engage over the ages, it essentially has been consumption, art, culture, as well as trade. So if the trade routes from the past could be mapped on to today's accessibility as well as technologies and the projects that are coming up, including what you referred to as the Maritime Conference that happened recently. There are a number of initiatives within the country that are coming in. The larger challenge would be to see how the older trade routes can be made more accessible or could be changed for speeding up access between the core points where the new consumption as well as the user points have emerged. That is what I would like to be maybe the focus of the discussion that we could go ahead because that is what is future looking from the point of view of what we do with the current knowledge that we have from the past and the new technologies as well as the, as well as the projects that are being planned including the one that uh, Professor Meena mentioned in Northeast. Because the moment there is instability and lack of trust, you cut off the Suez Canal, obviously that entire route is gone. We are not. I mean, we are not looking at Latin America yet. We are not gone on the other side. We are just looking at Asia Pac and we are looking at the Malacca. So here, there's a huge amount of people over here and all these routes are essentially enabling the movement of goods and services and people. And we need to juxtapose that with the past and the present and then come out with what is it that we are looking for. That is my submission, sir. If you could answer that. What are the maritime development ones? Sagaramala, many people talked about, I don't know, few things. There's something called river-sea connectivity. Blueprints have been drawn. You were talking in the morning also, it's in different context. They were, during the colonial period before that one, we used to have Buckingham canals from Vijayawada in Andhra region going right up to Madras, Chennai. For whatever there is there. But still, I had done some survey, not much. I went to place around this team. Forget the policies now. Whole lot of the people, anywhere from sand to mortar to motorcycle, fish, dogs, everything, people around the coast are still going or now mechanized boats. To some of them, government of India is giving some subsidy for their diesel and petrol. Pradhana Mantri Machya Sampada Yojana was introduced last year. In the latest budget, already some money has been categorized. I'm giving a practical example. 
there's something called developing the small ports, not the major ports like Paradeep or Navi Mumbai. Like, it's like I'll tell you for example, the, the Kakinada, even Machili Patnam, and the two around the peninsula, they have come under state. Unfortunately, state governments, except Gujarat and Kerala, some, they are not showing much interest because they want only central to give the money. Then there's something called also coastal shipping. Coastal shipping is different from highway shipping. Coastal shipping can be carried by small this. Chennai to Bangladesh, already the Hyundai automobile cars, which are made just around the industrial park in Chennai airport, are being already said. Not only Hyundai cars, this is called coastal shipping. In naval language, people also call it white shipping. I really don't know. Much is now already from Banaras to Halia port, the Ganga River has been, I don't know how much is done, that's connecting inland rivers to the ports. Many have been categorized under Sagaramala. I don't have updates how much has been done. So, and for the hinterland, say like Chhattisgarh, Bihar, Telangana, etc., there's some called ICDs, inland container depots. They come under Conquer Container Corporation of India. They are directly linked to, say, Telangana. We have a place called Sanatnagar, Kukatpalli. We have ICD there. It's connected to Navi Mumbai or nearest port Vishakapatnam. So things are moving. A country like which really suffered from sea blindness, we are really conscious. But, you know, it takes a lot of time. I'll quickly respond to the first question about Indo-Pacific and India's role in it. I think uh, uh, going by the capabilities of the Indian Navy and the larger Indian uh, system, defense system, I think it is important for India if as a sole actor it should focus only on the Indian Ocean. But in collaboration, in cooperation with a number of actors like the United States and uh, through a number of naval exercises, India has been cooperating with the actors, for example, through Quad. It, the Quad also became, uh, started as an humanitarian uh, aid exercise, but now it has become a sec more security oriented. But then India has had also signed a number of agreements with United States for uh, interoperability of their navies in the Indian Ocean. Similarly, India conducts a lot of exercises. I think one was mentioned by Professor Now. India conducts the Naval Symposium every two years. So, in cooperation with a number of other actors, India can actually make a mark in the Indo-Pacific, but as a sole actor, it should focus only in the Indian Ocean, on the Indian Ocean region. Uh, on the second uh, question on India's connectivity, connectivity with the rest of the world during uh, historical times, I think uh, there is a very interesting book which I really uh, like by Sugata Bose, who has become an MP now, a book called 100 Horizons. So it is the history of Indian Ocean in the global empire, during the global empire. That is a, ref a very interesting book to understand that Indian Ocean itself is not one region, right? It has been an inter-regional arena where multiple regions have interacted with each other. Uh, so we have now, currently, if you look at the Indian Ocean, there are close to 30 or 35 littoral states to the Indian Ocean. And then there are multiple regions. Uh, uh, Gulf is, so the West Asia region is one, the East, you cannot call the whole, uh, the East African littoral as one region. There are multiple regions within, then you have Southeast Asia, Australia stands apart as another, another region, then you have South Asia, then you have uh, South, Southeast Asia littoral to Bay of Bengal. So there are multiple regions which interact with each other. And I think uh, projects which focus on individual regions like uh, the IMAC will be mostly India, Middle East and Europe. So Middle East, the, in the context of the Indian Ocean, it is the Middle East which is important in this project. BIMSTAC has another focus. So these inter-regional projects could be the answer, well could be the answer for connectivity for Indian, from the Indian perspective. To answer your question, uh, Asia-Pacific versus Indo-Pacific, I think the designation is largely influenced by the geopolitical alignments. 
So whereas the Western world, led by the U.S., is calling Indo-Pacific, the Chinese and the Russians and the, their uh, allies are calling it Asia-Pacific. So I think probably it denotes the same area, but the focus of the Americans is clearly on integrating this whole region militarily, politically, economically, and seeking help of those countries which are prepared to accept that kind of uh, designation. Namaskar. Namaskar. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, thank you so much. Uh, we are in the midst of this conference. Yours is the last session now. And we are greatly looking forward to your presentation. Before, before, sir. Before formally inviting Dr. Sanjeev Ranjan, I take this opportunity to introduce him to this August guest audience. Dr. Sanjeev Ranjan is joining us through online. He has served in different capacities in government of India for over 35 years and has extensive experience in formulating public policy on finance, logistics, power, and infrastructure development. He assumed the post of Secretary, Ministry of Ports, Shipping and Waterways on 30th April 2020. He has previously served as Secretary, Ministry of Road Transport and Highways, and he was also Chairman, National Highway Authority of India. Dr. Ranjan has also worked on National Security Infrastructure Planning as Joint Secretary, Ministry of Defense, and he was also Secretary, Border Roads Development Board. As Director, Ministry of Heavy Industries, he was involved in the formulation of national automobile policy and also a vision document for making India into a global automotive hub. He has previously served as Chief Secretary in the Government of Tripura, Additional Secretary and Financial Advisor in the Ministries of Road Transport and Highways, Shipping and Tourism. He was also Principal Secretary in the Department of Power and Finance. He also served on the board of number of companies in the power, infrastructure, and tourism sectors. Dr. Ranjan received his B.Tech in Electrical Engineering from IIT Kanpur, MBA from Faculty of Management Studies, Delhi Universities, and MPhil from University of Glasgow, United Kingdom. Mr. Ranjan completed his PhD from IIT Delhi. He also received a degree in Masters in Public Management as the, at the National University of Singapore. He is the alumnus of National Defence College, New Delhi. With this brief introduction, now I request Dr. Sanjeev Ranjan to deliver his lecture on present state of ports, shipping and shipbuilding in India, challenges and opportunities. Dr. Sanjeev Ranjan. Uh, th thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, all the distinguished uh, uh, dignitaries on the dais and uh, my dear friends, who have joined this conference, I would like to indeed thank you for uh, making it happen. But clearly, the Institute of Indian Ocean Studies and the university for taking the trip, having this conference, which is of paramount importance for the maritime sector to make people aware of the kind of opportunities that exist. I have a small PowerPoint. I'll just share that with you in case I'll try to do it from here in case I can do it, nothing like it. Can you see this? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes, we can see, sir. So I'll just uh, run you through this PPT, which summarizes more or less the things which I want to say. The idea being that uh, the, can you still see it? Yeah, we can. OK, good. Uh, so uh, talking of the present state of poor shipping and shipbuilding, uh, the fact that India has a glorious tradition in the maritime sector, we all know it. And I'm sure the previous speakers have already highlighted in, in very many ways. Uh, so uh, we have made efforts in the recent past to be able to get back that glorious past. And we have, for example, in the last few years, been able to de those these things, like the 12 major ports that we have, we have added substantial capacity there. It's gone up to more than 2,600 million metric tons, which is an increase of more than 60% from the what it was about 10 years back. Similarly, the waterways, we have added quite a few. Now we have 111 waterways, which are open for uh, uh, waterway transport. So these are the kind of new developments and broad overview of the maritime sector that we have. But despite the recent initiatives, uh, only two of our ports are the top two in the world. That is Mundra and JNPT. 
uh, but one big thing that we have is a trained manpower. We have more than four lakh seafarers who are trained, and there's a great opportunity for youngsters to get into the sector. And therefore, the, the conference like this is going to be of great value. And the kind of opportunities that the sector offers, I'll just quickly run through it. And if you're able to get back to our glorious past, particularly the Deccan area has been instrumental in the kind of linkages that we had with the, the Southeast Asian countries, starting from the Pallavas to the Kalinga period from Odisha, going dating back to 2000 years. Similarly, on the Western coast, we had uh, links with uh, the Mesopotamian region. The Lothal is a great example, more than 5000 years old, where um, we have historic evidence of these kind of linkages. So the recent developments uh, have helped us to improve our logistics performance index, which was less than below 15, now we are 38. The uh, major ports, as you can see, the capacity added has been 102%. The cargo traffic has increased substantially, with increasing economic activity. We have now cruises going along our coast on the inland waterways. The uh, uh, mm, uh, lighthouse tourism is picking up. Uh, this is a graphical representation of the kind of increases that have taken place in terms of capacity. Coastal shipping and waterways are going big. And uh, multimodality has become important, where we have the PM Gati Shakti program as well as the new logistics policy. So all this is going to give a big push to the maritime sector. Uh, this is the slide which highlights those the various ports that we have along our coast, all along. And, and, uh, but still there are some challenges which uh, are shown here. To make things happen, we uh, had a new vision in 2030, which came about. And uh, this is the kind of initiatives which were uh, uh, done at that time. Uh, where on the port side, we have an uh, idea of going world class, have smart ports, reduce the logistics cost, make it safe and sustainable. On the shipping side, we want to really go big on shipbuilding. On the waterways, we have uh, uh, increase in the use of waterways to reduce pollution, to make it green, to use it for urban transport. Now, action on all these is already happening. The three major acts got amended in the last two years are the Major Port Authorities Act, the Maritime Aids Navigation Act, the Inland Vessel Act. Uh, parallelly, we have uh, the new uh, PPP uh, MCA, the, uh, which has helped to increase the participation of the private sector. And uh, the tariffs are now market determined. These are doing business has gone up substantially. We are going digital on all our platforms. These are kind of recent changes that have happened. And as I mentioned, because of the new model concession agreement that we have, the private sector is going big when it comes to development of ports. And instead of government needing to put in money, we have the private sector which is lapping up all the port development projects because they see a great business opportunity for themselves. And these are kind of numbers which highlight the kind of uh, action that is happening. Mm -hmm. We also have the Sagamala program, which has uh, things on port connectivity, modernization, industrialization, coastal community development, coastal shipping. Now, uh, which has really bought, energized the whole system. We also had recently, just about 15 days back, the Global Maritime India Summit, where all these things were showcased, and the private sector, the global investors, everything's coming in a big way. So this is the kind of opportunity that we have as far as the tools are concerned. And uh, while we have done good on the port side in terms of adding capacity, and these transformative reforms have already taken place, as I mentioned, the new acts have come in, the UIS model concession agreement has been done, the Sagramala program, the digitalization, etc. Uh, but still some challenges remain in the sense that uh, we have to go green. The pollution levels have to go down, the entire port shipping operations have to go green, they have to go digital, they have to become autonomous. And therefore, we have a vision, as I mentioned, for 2030. We also have a vision for 2047, which talks of adding our capacity four times more, going for hydrogen as a fuel, being big on who's the shipbuilding part needs to be further given a push. The ship reply cycling becomes number one. The model share of ways to go up. So with that kind of vision, we're already acting on the digital platform, what called the National Marit Maritime Window, where uh, the efficiencies would kick in and all the various stakeholders would be able to work together on the same digital platform. This is the maritime single window, the architecture on which work has is already uh, is already in, in, in play, 
and improvements are taking place by the day. Uh, so the logistics infrastructure linking them all together has to happen and requires trained manpower, so again, for which we have uh, programs starting at various maritime institutions. Uh, so digital is one big thing on which both on the ship side, on the port side, on the logistics chain side, things are happening. This slides highlight that. I would request these slides to be shared with all the participants so that they get a full detailed overview of what is happening on these various initiatives. While we do digital cybersecurity is a consideration on which we require again more trend power to be able to tackle such uh, challenges which come off and on. PM Ati Shakti, I mentioned to you that uh, the new program, the multimodality road, rail, waterways are to be seamlessly linked. And once they get linked, the container should be able to move seamlessly. And with containerization of the entire cargo, inland waterways and shipping becomes more viable and important. So, uh, as I said, on the coastal, these are the kind of initiatives that are happening, and a lot of uh, volumes have gone up substantially on the coastal shipping side. And these are the kind of numbers which highlight the kind of changes that have taken place. You can see the coastal cargo movement has more or less doubled. And Roro -ro pack services, which are possible in the Gulf of Kambat, across the Gulf of Kambat, instead of going around, we just cut across the bay. Similarly, in Bombay, along the Mandala, you can going around, we just cut across. So these are new things which are really, really encouraging and multimodality is becoming the order of the day. While we do this at home, we have, have connectivity with countries in our region. I'm sure that's been talked about earlier by the earlier speakers. But again, that is, uh, if happens, it adds to the kind of trade and business for our youngsters. And it's something on which we are parallelly working. Uh, the inland waterways, which runs through Bangladesh and the northeast, is operational. We had the longest schools running all the way from Bangladesh to, to uh, Dibrugar some time back. So the entire thing, which uh, can bring in a lot of action on the eastern side and linking countries in the region, is already happening. The policy part is already done. Uh, well, while we do this, the transshipment and Galatia Bay and Nicobar Island is something on which again we are working. So that seamless connectivity is available to all our good operations and things can move on the eastern coast through uh, this transshipment point rather than go to places outside the country. The shipbuilding part is a bit of a challenge where other countries have taken over in the sense that we have Korea, China, Japan, which are doing better. But in the vision, we have identified a, a clear kind of a pathway in the sense that vessels up to 20,000 EWT will be provide all the kind of incentives that are required and go big on this while we try for these tugs and coastal vessels, if we try for the greener ones, the shipbuilding, the ship repair and ship picking, we have a plan and uh, there is a bit of a cost disadvantage. For that, we have the uh, idea of uh, activation of demand, developing the ecosystem, providing regulatory support and building capacity which again, we have the shipbuilding assistance scheme, we have a grant uh, various kinds of subsidies, we have our number policy, we uh, ensure our goods by tax from domestic producers, we have the other schemes which can provide demand for shipbuilding. With that, hopefully, we should be able to become a world leader when it comes to providing green vessels and green tugs. And this is the kind of opportunity which is now there on which our ship uh, yards are working. Cochin Shipyard, for example, is already supplying vessels to the European customers. They recently supplied this vessel, which is autonomous and green, for uh, a Norwegian company. And similarly, other shipyards uh, also are, are making these modern vessels, which can be uh, something which other shipyards can emulate and they become a world leader in this field. I'm just putting some slides to give an idea. This Cochin Metro system. Uh, provides linkages between the various places, which is another big thing that has happened. So these are the kind of mm, and hydrogen cell and uh, the hydrogen powered vessel. The pilot is already uh, being done and can be a big thing into the future. Electric catamarans uh, in Cochin is already working, more are being made and maybe the usual uh, vessels which used to run on bunker oil and diesel would in the future be running on electric and therefore be pollution free something which uh, I think the whole country and the whole world is very hopeful and can become a world leader in these kind of vessels. And that is what is the new kind of a, a plan as far as the ministry is concerned. 
and private sector is also participating in this and uh, going further ahead from electric i'm sure the transition will be to green ammonia and green hydrogen but again that is a few years off but we are getting prepared and all the work is being done by the ministry and uh, for that we already have a few of these knowledge centers which we have set up and with that the kind of requirements which are there we should be become a world leader at least in the green vessel smaller size needs to come and be able to realize the vision that we have so this broadly gives you a a, a quick run through of the kind of various initiatives that we have i would like to thank you here then open up for discussion thank you very much Thank, thank you, you sir thank, thank you. you dr ranjan yes please yeah that was a very comprehensive presentation and really we greatly appreciate uh, it gives a gave us a, a full picture of the activities of with respect to ship building shipping uh, coastal shipping and so on um, i have one question with respect to the ship building activity um, is it the constraint of capital or is it the policy uh, uh, inertia up till now or what are what are the causes what has led india to be lagging behind so badly with respect to ship building and what are the steps which you are now initiating which will take us into that uh, leading ship building powers as your presentation just now made yeah uh, the uh mm, slide one of the slides that i showed you you would have seen that the uh, uh, cost of manpower in india is slightly more than some of the other uh, countries in the world and in addition to manpower there are issues of financing now because of these two reasons the uh, indian ship builders have lost out uh, pre 2011 the meltdown the global uh, financial meltdown quite a few of the big shipyards had come in but unfortunately because of the meltdown they lost out and example there are four shipyards big ones which uh, ran into problems and therefore after 2011 there has been a lukewarm kind of a demand for ships now uh, but after that we had the vision 2030 and as i showed you in the slides uh, while we would like to become big on the ship building side and i told you two problems of uh, the uh productivity labor productivity and the financing cost to make up for that we already have a ship uh, a subsidy scheme to make up for that in addition uh, we have now thought that if you focus on the smaller vessels and the world is going to transition to cleaner vessels with new kind of uh, fuel and so on and so forth so if we are able to become a world leader both in terms of design and manpower uh, skills etc etc we can recapture the space and therefore as i showed you in the slide we are going to start going big on a class of vessels which are less than 20000 dwt which can be run on alternative fuels and we have already started doing it for domestic market through atmanirbhar program etc etc and as we go forward we should be able to uh, build up scale and as we build up scale for with the domestic demand in the days to come we are already getting orders from the europeans from the other countries and they are also under the green requirements are required to phase out old vessels and go for greener vessels so those orders should come to us if we are prepared for that in time and that is a kind of strategy which has been adopted in the vision 2030 and uh, people are already working full scale on this and with that uh, and uh, our youngsters getting fully involved in this we should be able to recapture that space so that is a strategy as i mentioned we had the disadvantage in terms of financing because of uh, interest rates and so on and some taxation issues but again we have the uh, uh, some uh, arrangements worked out where for example the financing done through gift city in ahmedabad uh, they sh- uh, people should have access to global finances and even that limitation which is there our ship builders can get over that so mechanisms have been worked out to be able to uh, support uh, the ship builders and be able to overcome the kind of handicaps they used to face earlier thank you very much uh, <clears throat> dr ranjan sir i am dr ramesh i run a think tank on internal security and foreign affairs center for human security studies in hyderabad i have a very specific question because last one and a half years 18 months we have been working on port security management and emerging technologies part of this 
I had personally been to six ports of the government, major government ports. Because we have 180 minor ports, I had been to 12 major ports uh, managed by government of India. Sir, one glaring security lapse that I would like to bring to your kind attention because you are at the helm of affairs. Even though you stepped out, I mean, retired from IAS, but still, you can actually give it as an input, sir. Containers are not being scanned properly. As a result, drug trafficking, human trafficking, arms trafficking is so much because I know there are millions of containers go through, uh, you know, in and out. But the Container Security Initiative India is not part still. Or we have any other via media that you people have thought about to scan the containers? Number one question. How do we leverage emerging technologies such as AI, blockchain, IoT, big data, 5G for the safety security of port? In other words, also extending it to ship. What is the preparedness of government of India? Because when we studied the ports across the globe, the Dubai, the Amsterdam, uh, the Antwerp port, the Rotterdam port, and some other ports in China, they have gone too far an extent in the digitalization of the ports. This will increase the profitability as well as the in and out and time turnover and turnaround time and all that birth completion. May, many many things are there, sir. So I know because of the paucity of time, I am not able to interact with you much. But I will definitely get back to you, sir. So please comment on the port security management of India with special reference to emerging technologies. To what extent India has leveraged the emerging tech? Thank you, sir, Dr. Ramesh. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, I am not holding our official capacity any longer, so uh, I'll not be able to give you your official reaction. But uh, and I can assure you that the uh, uh, all the agencies are uh, have always been and are fully aware of the kind of challenges and adequate precautions, adequate safeguards exist. And there are protocols which are in place to take care of uh, the security requirements. Uh, there are risk analysis, the latest of technology in terms of AI, in terms of risk assessment, in terms of other things which keep emerging. Our agencies keep uh, uh, mm, uh, in, mm, learning from that and keep improving the kind of protocols that are there. We at our ports are part of the ISPS system. Uh, which provides for an elaborate code for security. But of course, as you mentioned very correctly, there are new technologies, new solutions which keep emerging. And be it our ports, be it the shipping, be it uh, the Coast Guard, be it the other security agencies, they keep looking at it and keep improving on upon the kind of arrangements that exist. Uh, container scanning and so on is something which has been in uh, the... Uh, uh, it is already be happening at all the places, and the way to do it is well laid out in by way of a protocol. Uh, there is always scope to further strengthen that, but one has to uh, decide between how much of uh, inconvenience it causes to the port users, to the business. So a trade-off has to be there between ease of doing business and uh, imposing any kind of extra time and cost to the port users. And uh, a considered call is required to be taken when it comes to uh, any such operation. And that's what it keeps getting done. Uh, one way would be that we stop everything, scan everything, check everything. It will that take days and that would create a bit of a challenge for everyone. So a balanced view is required to be taken. And I think that's what keeps getting done. So then I would like to assure that uh, all the agencies are always prepared, making sure that uh, things are secure. Yeah, I think that's the biggest asset that we have, the trained manpower. We used to have about two lakh odd seafarers who were trained. Now we have four lakhs. This has happened over the last 10 years. Now, uh, the idea is that we should become number one in the world when it comes to providing seafarers. And with the kind of population dividend that we have, we should be able to reach that. We have these maritime training institutes all over. And DG Shipping regulates the quality of the sea trade seafarers which are uh, come to the market. And they are continuously improving along with the maritime training issues to uh, improve the quality of training and make it world class. There are challenges with respect to language and other things which are now part of the curriculum. So that the seafarers which are trained in these issues become prized commodities when it comes to 
for the international shipping lines. Uh, we have countries like Philippines and so on, which uh, have been able to capture the world market. And now we have a strategy of being able to produce manpower better in quality and be able to compete with the other countries which are number one in the world. And with the population dividend that we have and the infrastructure that we've been able to create and DG shipping with quite a few of these online facilities in terms of examination, certification, etc., which they are now providing, our youngsters find it easier to get all that done. So facilitation for the seafarers for training, improving the quality is a thing which is going on. For placement, you have the placement agencies, which are also registered and regulated by the DG shipping, so that uh, people who join the uh, merchant, West merchant uh, uh, ships, uh, their uh, um, welfare, etc., is taken care of. So that the youngsters find lucrative and, and, and join this area in larger numbers. And a conference of this kind in a university and uh, where the youngsters are there to tell the, to for them to carry the message of the kind of opportunities in the maritime sector, be it port shipping and also as seafarers, as merchant navy uh, candidates, is something which this conference should be able to convey. And uh, is a great thing and with blue economy becoming bigger and bigger with coastal shipping and the multimodal shift happening the sector has huge opportunities which our people should be able to capture and thanks for organizing this conference this message should be able to we should be able to carry this message to everyone and uh, hopefully with that uh, we already have uh, been able to go as i said uh, to more than two and a half lakhs of seafarers who are employed in the next uh, five, six years, we should be able to teach four lakhs and become number one in the world. So with the active involvement of everyone, we should become number one. We have the potential, we have the manpower, we have the will. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. We have come to the end of technical session. Thank you so much for all the speakers. Now I invite my colleague, Dr. Shahid Jamal, for a, to give a formal vote of thanks. Uh, good evening to everybody uh, for being the part of uh, this uh, seminar. Uh, before I extend my vote of thanks, uh, I would like to conclude my concluding remarks very quickly because we're all running short of time. Uh, in this uh, sessions, in this afternoon sessions, we have uh, three papers. The first paper was presented by Professor P. V. Uh, Rao who actually focused on Bay of Bengal maritime connections. And in this paper, he highlighted the significance of some ports and their connections and the movement of uh, commercial items across the Indian Oceans. He also focused on the significance of the agents working in two languages, that is Persian and Telugu. There is no doubt about the fact that the Bay of Bengal region has emerged as a critical avenue in shaping the evolving geopolitics in the Indo-Pacific because it connects both India and Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, in the recent times, uh, the Bay of Bengal is fast emerging as a critical area of economic strategic competitions in the Indo-Pacific uh, context. We have to also look at the fact that India's engagement in the Bay of Bengal has been viewed as a key driver of its broader Indo-Pacific outlook. India's naval engagement in the Bay uh, with its uh, partners in the Quad demonstrate uh, the significance accorded to the region in the broader Indo-Pacific context. In contrast to this, the Bay of Bengal region continues to remain a marginal aspect of Euro's engagement in the Indo-Pacific, uh, you know, this is something which need to be focused much more in the coming research. And I'm hopeful that Professor P. V. Rao will take into account these aspects of, uh, you know, uh, uh, less researched area. Uh, the second paper was uh, presented by uh, Professor uh, Krishnendra Meena. Uh, uh, the title of his paper was Geopolitical Significance of India, Middle East, uh, Europe, Europe Economic Corridor, uh, IMIC, and it's, it's a very significant topic in the context of what we're seeing right now, uh, uh, 
the conflict between Hamas and you know Israel, and he has uh, some some of the uh, you know uh, uh, audience also pointed out that uh, you know it will the time which actually tell us uh, how, you know how much success uh, it will get in the coming days because you know I, I was recently listening to uh, Hyber who was a human ri rights lawyer uh, who has recently resigned from his post uh, you know after this Hamas in Israel conflict and he has rightfully mentions that you know the displacement of 2.2 million and Palestinians into the Sinai area should not be looked in, into in, in vacuum because you know uh, there is the security reasons there. You know Israel is somewhere is is uh, you know afraid of the fact that in order to make this corridor or I make functional, there must be some sort of security in that region. And he's, since there is a political disturbance in that area, he thinks that you know the Hamas later on. Uh, may create some sort of uh, you know problems in the near future. So this displacements of 2.2 million you know Palestinians in the Sinai regions of Egypt must be looked in this context also. And I think since this is a nascent uh, you know topic, I think much more insight will be uh, you know uh, come uh, in, in the near future. And the third, uh, you know, uh, uh, one thing which I would like to mention here is that, you know, he has uh, rightly mentioned the role of Turkey here because we know that somewhere Turkey feels that it's being, you know, bypassed or sidelined by uh, those actors who are actively involved in this uh, 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 project. And he, he has rightly mentioned the kind of challenge, uh, you know, this, this corridor is going to be faced by three powers like Iran and China and, uh, and, and Turkey. And uh, we, you know, it would be too early to say anything about the, you know, the success of, of this corridor. Only the time will tell us very correctly whether this project is going to be successful or not. The third paper which was, uh, you know, was presented by Professor Raji Ranjan who, uh, you know, uh, Raju Ranjan, who actually focused uh, present state of post shipping and shipbuilding in India, challenges and opportunity. Uh, you know, he, he focused on the recent reforms in Indian maritime sectors and increase in shipbuilding in recent decades. And at the same time, he also focused enhancing coastal connectivity. Uh, you know, uh, as, as Professor, uh, uh, you know, uh, Dev, uh, so these are uh, asked the questions. You know, what is the reasons uh, behind? Uh, you know, I mean, uh, what is the reason why India is actually lagging behind China uh, in terms of uh, you know uh, 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 shipbuilding? I would go with the uh, uh, the statement or the argument made by uh, uh, Admiral Saab that you know there is some sort of political you know lag from the Indian government. And as long as, long as there is a political lack, uh, I, I mean, uh, political, uh, I mean, uh, uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, lack from the Indian government, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, uh, we are going to leave behind China and some other uh, countries in terms of uh, uh, shipbuilding. With this, I will, you know, end uh, my concluding remarks. Before we disperse, I would like to extend my thanks all the actors uh, you know who contributed uh, to make this uh, uh, you know program successful first i would like to extend uh, my thanks on behalf of uh, the center for deccan studies to uh, honorable vice chancellor professor sayed anul hasan sahab and the registrar sahab professor ishtiaq sahab and at the same time i would like to extend my thanks to uh, 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 indian uh, ocean studies, uh, especially Professor uh, you know, Krishnan Meena, uh, 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 Ambassador Sudhir Sahib, and all those at, you know attendants and servants who whosoever was there, uh, you know who made this uh, uh, program or conference successful. I would like to thanks at the end of uh, you know to every audience who took out their precious time to be the part of this program. With this word of thanks, I conclude my words. Thank you for all.